All right, so let's get started. Sorry for that uh, delay. Uh, let me just um, pull up something here. All right, great. Okay, so um, I guess uh, minor announcements that uh, the, I went through all of the Muddy's Point submissions. Thanks for those, it's really great. Um, things that I thought would be addressed very quickly in class, I didn't really respond to, but any other things I left some comments on. So uh, particularly on that question two, the muddiest side. So um, if you wanna review your Muddy's Point submissions, you might be able to find a couple of comments from me in response to that. Um, otherwise, if you left some muddiest points that I didn't respond to, I probably thought that we're about to kind of cover those anyway. But I guess that's sort of the, the biggest thing. Um, so then otherwise, so chapter one of Moorcroft. And so uh, this chapter is kind of covering Moorcroft's version of what we were talking about last week. So I like to sort of compare and contrast different takes on it, my take on things, Moorcroft's take on things, where we agree, where we disagree to kind of give you a flavor of where the commonalities are kind of across the, the modeling field. And so Moorcroft starts with, I think this nice example that I like of monopoly. And so this is, center uh, here is uh, the original patent for the monopoly game. Uh, you can see more modern versions, this is a Mandalorian themed monopoly game. Um, you can find Super Mario Brothers themed monopoly games um, and sort of the uh, original version here you find that regardless of which version you're working in, although some of the names on the tiles change, the basic game remains the same. And that really speaks to how generalizable Monopoly is. So if we're trying to think about, you know, a London Monopoly versus a New York Monopoly, it's true if you buy Monopoly in London, you'll find different names on things, but the same process kind of works. And so somehow, the simplicity of monopoly, of course, there are limitations to that. You can never learn how to participate. You'd be a, you could never probably win the real estate market in New York City just by becoming an expert at monopoly. But you could learn a lot about real estate that might transfer across London and New York, you know, with the commonalities there. And that's kind of the big point here in this monopoly game is that what has, um, what they've done let me see if I can get rid of that toast up top there. I can find my mouse. All right, so what Monopoly has done is, um, is taken the salient features of real estate and it's dumped it into the game, stripping out things that are probably not as important. So for example, in Monopoly, there's a jail, but there's no police because you don't really need to know about the micro scale operations of a police force, but you do need to know that there's certain rules you have to obey. And if you don't obey those rules, then you can go to jail for certain amounts of time. And so, and that kind of goes into your calculus there. So you can take the salient features, put them into an overly simplistic, uh, maybe model here, but still learn something about it. And that will give you kind of useful insight. So if after you bring this simplified model into this game, in learning how to play Monopoly, you might learn some real estate principle, some generic real estate principle that's transferable across lots of contexts that maybe needs to be custom tailored to actually go into action in a New York City or in a London. But you learned it because you could rapidly manipulate this simple model and then experiment with what you learn in the real model. So you're again, probably not gonna become a real estate tycoon by becoming you know, an, a master at Monopoly, but you probably are going to learn a lot more about Monopoly or about real estate by playing Monopoly than you would without playing Monopoly. And so that's kind of what I'm saying here is that metaphors like Monopoly, you can view, and a lot of people mentioned this in their muddiest points and also in perusal, that there is a relationship between the game and a metaphor. So you can think of monopoly as a model for real estate. You can also think of it as a metaphor for real estate. It's highly generalizable, strips out the ugly details to make it hard to find those connections so that it sort of becomes a lens on the kind of important points. And I bring up a metaphor here because metaphors do the exact same thing. And I would argue that metaphors are 
very generic versions of models as well. So there's this you know, phrase here, if a picture is worth a thousand words then a metaphor is worth a thousand pictures. We look at this picture as an example of that. It's a cartoon. You see a guy sitting in front of a doctor. The guy has got a knife in his back. The doctor says to the guy, good news, the test results show it's a metaphor. In other words, you don't actually have a knife in your back, but when someone said, um, oh, you know, he, you know, or if, if a person were to say to the doctor, oh, it's like you got a, a knife in my back. But what, what they're saying is that someone, when you weren't looking, took advantage of you for their own gain. And so, of course, you're not trying to communicate the physiology of what goes on when a knife goes in your back, but you're using this as a metaphor for all of the different ways people can kind of betray you or double cross you. And so rather than going into the details of like, oh, well, you know, my, uh, my partner or my, um, or even my children or whoever, um, you know, somebody I was working with on a team, um, you can go into all of those micro scale details, but in the end, uh, there are a bunch of social interactions, which can just be simplified by saying, oh, he stabbed me in the back. So, um, so a metaphor, in a way, is a model for a wide range of phenomena all at once. The same way monopoly is a model for a wide range of real estate principles that apply generally. When you actually need to you know, implement a policy, you're probably going to need more details, but you can start in the learning process with these simplistic models. Another important metaphor that comes out of this is the metaphor of the spectrum. When we talk about a spectrum, um, you know, we think about spectra of light, you know, uh, Roy G. Biv um, going from the blues and the violets on one side to the reds and the oranges on the other side. And if we look up the definition of a spectrum, it's a continuous sequence or range. So we can say there's a wide spectrum of interests. We can say there's opposite ends of political spectrum. When you say to someone that there is a spectrum, what you're communicating to them is that there's not a few discrete ideas or a few discrete entities, there's always a new entity in between and the other entity. There's always a smooth scale. So um, saying, you know, opposite ends of the political spectrum suggests that the far right and the far left are kind of ideals, but everyone actually lands somewhere in between with no two people probably landing in exactly the same spot. So it's a very powerful way to communicate a general idea. And we can actually use this idea to talk about modeling. So in this class, we're gonna talk about, and Moorcroft talks about this, um, how we have a modeling spectrum where we've got analog models, which is like actually doing the work of do, running an experiment in New York City. And then metaphorical models, actually instead of doing the hard work of implementing a real estate policy, just playing it out in a game. And, something in between, which we're going to call illustrative models. And so what we'll see, and every model can fit somewhere on this spectrum, it's almost more useful to use a spectrum to compare two models, as opposed to sort of say what the absolute position of, of models are. And what we're going to learn about this spectrum is that analog models, these, when you go into modeling, everyone wants to build an analog model. You want to throw in every single detail. There were some great comments in uh, the perusal where people were saying about, you know, could, couldn't a model be 100% accurate? And, um, and wouldn't the, what would the value of that be? And it's true that you could throw in the kitchen sink into your model to try to build every single detail that goes on in New York City, including how the police run. But when you do that, you're just gonna make a very large, complicated model. It's as bad as New York City itself if somebody were to point at your simulation model and say why did that thing happen it's just as bad as pointing at the real new york city and saying why did that thing happen and so you often lose your explainability by adding in a bunch of things by reducing and then also the sim because it has to keep track of all these things is going to be very slow you might have to run it on very fast computers so you might hear about um you know models of the universe or models of um, even you know jet engines and things like that requiring supercomputers to run to be able to solve these things. They are because they're keeping track of so many details. And so um, they can be very cum cumbersome. And in the end, if you do learn anything here, you don't learn fundamentals that could be transferable to 
a San Francisco or a UCLA. I mean, Los Angeles is super different than New York City. And so what you're gonna learn here might really be helpful um, for your operation in New York, but you move across the country and you land in LA and you're gonna have to remodel the whole thing because LA is just so different. But there are overlaps between uh, LA and New York and those overlaps exist by simplifying your model and finding, um, you know, getting rid of some of these details that keep them sort of apart. And so that's a, um, by reducing our models, we increase generalizability and we also have the ability to get more insight into fundamental processes. And so uh, someone brought up in the perusal um, about, you know, global warming. Well, a lot of people could say that there are a bunch of different things that could contribute to global warming. It might have to do with carbon dioxide. It might have to do with natural uh, oscillations in the orbit of the earth around the sun. If you built a very simplistic model of the earth that did not have a rise in carbon dioxide, but had a wobble around the sun, and then you built another overly simplistic model that did not have a wobble around the sun, but did have a carbon dioxide rise, you could compare the outputs of those two models and say, which one looks more realistic? And you might find that if you only have a wobble around the sun, you do not get the variations that you see in the real world. Now, just because your carbon dioxide model produces those variations doesn't mean that there couldn't be other things contributing to it that you stripped out. But by simplifying the models, you can start kicking out some hypotheses for phenomena. So genera generating simplistic models is a part of the scientific process to focus on specific hypotheses. And so that's why these can be a little bit more transferable in their insight. Now in this class, we like to focus on the ideal balance here. And so as I'll talk about here, we'll kind of be more um, around here where we want our models to have enough detail that they don't look like a monopoly game. Because it's just not very compelling to say, you should invest your $10 million and real estate because of the strategy I use to beat my friend at Monopoly. You know, so you need to incorporate some details in order to show that you're grounded in something that's closer to the real system. But you have to ask yourself, how many details do I need? And what can I leave out? And hopefully if I leave out enough, things go from being so cryptic that I don't understand them that I might as well just experiment on the real system to being where I included four or five important interconnecting details that I can now play with in a more systematic way to get insight. So it's this ideal balance where you get the best of both worlds. That's where we like to build models. So that's why the labs down the street from here who are doing modeling are not doing it with board games, but uh, they also aren't necessarily um, going out and trying to uh, directly experiment on these systems. Now, once you build a model here, you're gonna generate an idea that needs to be tested. And how do you test it? You move to a more realistic model and test it there and so on and so forth. It's like the mouse, the lab mouse, you might test it here and then you might move to a primate trial and then you might move to a human trial and then you might move to more generic human trials on, on a wider uh, you know, groups of, of uh, populations. And, each one of those steps is moving to a more realistic model so that eventually you come out the other end with a, you know, a phase two, phase three trials of a drug or something like that. And you have a pretty good confidence that because they worked for this population, they're going to work for the human population uh, as a whole, or at least most of them. So we start with the mouse and we finally end up in the human uh, through a step. So, that's the other thing is you can criticize the simplicity of these models, but you have to realize that you're usually a first step. All right, so any questions about this idea of the modeling spectrum before we start um, playing with this a little bit more? I guess let me make, sort of summarize what I'm saying. If I go back to the George Box quote, all models are wrong or some are useful. The only question of interest is the model and we are useful. This is Box saying details are always gonna be left out. The whole point of modeling is figuring out the right details to leave out. And so then that goes along with, have we included those right details in order to learn something new? So um, are there any questions or comments on this idea of this modeling spectrum? Again, there were some great comments I saw in uh, 
in perusal in particular about people talking about this and you know is a metaphor a model and how is a metaphor like a model and so i really appreciate that all right so let's sort of think about this then so romeo and juliet so romeo and juliet is um of course a um is of course a uh you know play by shakespeare of course it follows along with ideas that Shakespeare got from a lot of plays that came before him, and it has withstood the test of time, uh, despite the context being a little bit fantasy and a little bit removed from modern day. Of course, they've made um, you know, these so-called grotesque versions where they, you know, they, they take maybe the exact same dialogue, but they place it within a more modern setting. Um, and of course, then there's things like West Side Story, where they completely rewrote the dialogue but maintain the storyline. And overall, the, 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 the basic story, even though it's super simplistic, I mean, but it, it speaks to people. And so people, you know, Romeo and Juliet stays around, not because anyone has ever gone through anything like this. I mean, it's, it's very rare to see in this day and age two warring factions that really go to blows where you actually have life and death on the line and love mixed up in the middle of it. I mean, when that does happen, they make movies about it, right? But every, you know, most of us don't have experienced that. And yet there's something about Romeo and Juliet that I think everyone can relate to, you know, this idea, uh, you know, of love, of star-crossed love and so on and so forth. And so it's, it's sort of not realistic whatsoever. And yet, somehow very generalizable. So with that in mind, where would we put it on the modeling spectrum? So I guess I'll just say, um, so those online, you can tell me left, middle, or right. And those in the class, I'm just going to sweep my hand from the left, middle, to right. And then, um, and I'll stop at points. And then you can raise your hand for where you think Romeo and Juliet should go. So if we view Romeo and Juliet as a model for maybe social interactions, um, then, um, would it be here, maybe over here, maybe somewhere in the middle, see a couple of hands starting to raise, kind of a gradient as you can feel, somewhere over here, a lot of hands just went up, somewhere over here, and then a couple of hands. So there was a preponderance of hands in the class for kind of this um, in between middle and right. Um, online, I see right, more to the right, fourth arrow, more to the right, fourth. So there's a lot, again, online, preponderance of those around here. And I think that's probably where I would put it, here or maybe even farther um, over to the right here. So it's, you know, it's super removed from reality. And yet somehow it still tells a message that it's easy to relate. On the other side of it, you can think about, well, here's a racing simulator where you've got people sitting in a chair. So they're not in a real car, they're not going anywhere. Um, but they've got multiple monitors around them positioned um, in ways that allow them to kind of feel like they're looking out of a, of a vehicle. You see very uh, realistic looking, um, you know, roads in front of them. Uh, over here, I think you actually see multiple individuals um, in a simulator uh, together. Um, so there's multiple individuals. So you can see three monitors here, another three monitors up here. Another three monitors, three monitors, three monitors. So there's at least five people participating simultaneously in this racing uh, simulator. And then so in this case, um, you know, where do we think this uh, model sits? So I guess let's do the same sort of thing. So, um, so now, likewise, those online, tell me left, middle, right, or some combination of those. And then in here, I'll look for some hands. So how many people would put this at analog? All right, well, right next to analog. See, a lot of hands go up. Illustrative, more hands probably equal between these two um, over here. Nobody over here, nobody. So now it seems like in class, we've got kind of a, a mass of uh, voting for around here. Um, online, we've got, um, we've got you know, sort of a, 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 a several sort of voting for around the middle. Um, and so, but I think we're all agreeing that relative to Romeo and Juliet, it's certainly um, closer to analog than metaphorical. And, and I guess when we sort of look at this racing simulator, and that's where I would sort of put it too, I'd put it 
Um, you know, it's not realistic detail. Analog would be actually driving the car. But this is not driving the car. But my guess is that if you got pretty good at this, then if you put yourself in the real car, you at least wouldn't kill yourself. And so, um, whereas if you didn't get good at this and then you put yourself in the real you know, race car, not a, your average everyday vehicle, um, then you might, you, know, you might not be able to handle it very well. You might, not, um, you might be totally calibrated for everyday street driving and not for racing, and you might put yourself in serious danger. And so this is a big reason why when you train pilots, you train them in simulators like this, even more realistic simulators that are maybe even closer to analog but they don't put yourself in the real, uh, real uh, danger. But I mean, the downside of this is whereas a Mario Kart style racing, closer to kind of metaphorical, is gonna talk about sort of general racing principles, this is actually tailored to a particular vehicle. So you might learn a lot about driving that particular vehicle, but if you then moved into, you know, if you were in a NASCAR simulator and you moved into a Formula One or something like that, it may not transfer quite as well. So when we make the decision to step closer and closer to realistic detail, we're always asking the question, am I adding the right details? Am I making this too tailored to a particular system? Which is again, great. it's great to start kind of in the middle so you can play with the fundamentals and then gradually add on layers as you're absolutely sure which direction is the right direction to head in. Okay, so any questions or comments about that or disagreements about classifications of these two examples? Okay, so um, putting two of these together, we've got a fisheries model like the one we saw in Moorcroft. And then we've got this weird example over here where they've actually taken effectively a net that is a, a it goes down very far in the middle of a large body of water, let's say the ocean. And inside that, the net goes down so far that fish that they're studying are going to are completely contained in this net. They can't get out. So, um, but the seawater and the microorganisms that the fish eat or the things that the fish eat, eat can get through the net. So here you've got a model of maybe, you know, a a wild situation that has a little bit of control over the population like you'd have in, um, in a real fishery, like a fishery that you'd have, like a freshwater fishery or something like that. Um, whereas here we have you know, a, a very generic, simplistic model of a fishery uh, that um, has no specific, doesn't even have parameters for all of the different kind of like microbiota that could come through this net here. So I, mean, I hope we can kind of agree that this is much more analog than this. Um, we don't may not agree exactly where this fits. I mean, in some ways, this is actually out in the middle of the ocean somewhere. Uh, and so it seems extremely realistic, but it also doesn't allow the fish to get out of this thing, which, you know, maybe that's really important. It also doesn't allow for larger things to migrate through this area. It might also be a relatively small area relative to the population. Um, so, uh, so, you know, it's probably not way far over here, but it's certainly pretty darn close because it's trying to incorporate all of the small scale features that you actually get in um, a real uh, ecosystem here. Whereas this over here is really just trying to capture the salient features of population dynamics. So this is really focusing on you measure some rate that the fish reproduce, you measure some rate that they're caught, and how do those things uh, balance against each other in this dynamical system. So this is much more kind of um, on this side here. This gives us kind of maybe insights that can uh, translate across wide ranges of fisheries. Anything we learn here is probably going to be, um, anything we learn on the left-hand side here is probably going to um, kind of, give us inferences that are not going to generalize very well to other parts of the world where the water temperature is different, for example, or where there's a different um, uh, trophic levels underneath the fish that we're studying and so on and so forth. And so this is very tailored to one area, whereas this is very generalizable. So which one's better? There's no better here. It depends on the question you're answering or you're asking. If you're asking a very fundamental question about 
populations, I would say this is the better model to approach that in. If you're asking a very specific case about how does nitrogen levels affect, you know, certain aspects of regeneration, well, then maybe this is the better one here because you don't have to try to build a mathematical model of how nitrogen flows through the system. It's just already there. All right, so any questions about this, about the kind of the, the difference between these two and how one might be useful in one case, but not useful in another and vice versa. There is no better along this spectrum. Models just are used to answer different things. Okay. All right, and so if we take a lot of the models that we brought up so far, this is roughly where I would put them on the modeling spectra. You might disagree, um, and that's fine, because again, this spectra is really a conceptual tool for us to think about directions of movement along the spectra, comparing these two, um, as opposed to thinking about absolute position here. And so as a modeler, it's important to kind of know when you're moving one direction or the other, as opposed to knowing exactly where um, one tool fits. So um, you always have to kind of know when there's room on one side of it. So can we make this more specific? Can we make this less specific and more generalizable? So that's kind of the thing. You get more costly on one side, um, but more generalizable and cheaper on the other side. You will eventually have to walk that direction if you ever want to implement one of these things, but we are very often will start over here. And so um, in this class, we're trying to start with models that are kind of closer to metaphorical. So they're much a little bit more simple than the models you might work with in reality. Um, so maybe in a, a realistic um, application, you might start closer to here. For educational purposes, we start kind of over here in this class, um, just so we have you know, fewer stocks and flows to deal with. Um, but uh, but then by the end of this class, you'll be ready to start kind of closer to here. All right. So um, so before we get into the world dynamics and things like that, any questions or comments about this basic framework? This seem pretty clear. The motivation. So again, I'm just trying to get us out of the mode of thinking about models as being better or worse based on their accuracy. All right, so in the book, um, they start out with this example. So this is a simplistic version of a world dynamics or limits to growth model uh, that came up from this guy, Jay Forrester. So the name comes up at System Dynamics Modeling Forrester quite a bit. Um, I'll give some caveats about this model in a moment here. But the basic idea, Morkov simplified it and said, you can kind of think about the whole world as being simplified into these five stocks. And we'll talk more and more about what stocks are as we get into actually building stock and flow diagrams. This is just kind of a picture of where we're going. And so the whole world is sort of population, pollution, um, capital in terms of kind of infrastructure, um, capital in agriculture, and then natural resources. And the assumption here is that the natural resources are finite and they're not being renewed. So these are non-renewable natural resources. That assumption, um, even if they are renewable, the, the idea here is that the resource usage rate is going to be so much bigger than the renewal rate that we basically can consider them to be um, non-renewable. And so you take these things, and, um, and if you look closely in this ugly diagram that was in the appendix, you can actually find all five of these things up here in this diagram down here. And so there are these little boxes, like here's the pollution box, and it's got these flows coming in and out of it. Um, there's a capital investment down here, uh, population, and so on. You can find all those here. And what Forrester was saying is I can take these five simple um, quantities and let them all vary with respect to each other and be influenced by each other. And so he built an influence network, and it looks ugly, but if you were to zoom in, uh, and you can see that they've got all of these, these little multipliers about like birth death rate from a material multiplier. And so he's got these things that individually, you could probably find data to justify. You could say, um, you know, based on how much um, capital is involved, um, how is that gonna affect the birth rate? Um, is it gonna make the birth rate higher or lower if this capital goes up or down? And so each one of these little lines 
is something that hopefully you can defend to a stakeholder. You can say, this is a small scale relationship that I believe in and I think you can believe in if you just let me walk through this. And if you were to walk through this with all of these whatever hundred arrows or something like that, you could get a stakeholder to, to buy all hundred of those arrows. And then you put those hundred arrows together and it forms this complex web that the, the, the web is what captures all of the sort of surprising outputs. And so Forrester was to say, um, I got these five stocks and I got all these different ways I can go together. If I change the ways in which they influence each other, I move some parameters up, some parameters down, then I can get a picture of um, global population, let's just say, that collapses in so many years. But under slightly different variations in those parameters, I can get a sustainable um, outcome where the carrying capacity for the human population stays flat and the population just rises to it and then rests alongside it. And so this is sort of saying like, well, I don't know necessarily what the parameters are for the globe. I can try to approximate them. And maybe I would predict that we're currently in this situation, but it's more of a strategic planning to say, well, what's even possible? And what this sort of says is that with this web of connections, without even worrying about external shocks to the system, you know, asteroids hitting or whatever like that, without even worrying about any of that stuff, the system as a whole internally has the capacity to either be sustainable or collapse. And so deterministic choices we make on how to use the resources help us move us closer to this situation than that situation. And that's kind of the message that Forrester was trying to say here, is that a simple model can give you rich output behaviors and show you that these output behaviors are a function of things that go on inside the model, as opposed to external shocks that you're waiting for to come from outside them. Now, um, how might you use that? Well, if you look at real world data, say with a fishery, then, you can see that there's two fisheries are going to have maybe um, a, a, a commonality in their trajectory for a certain similar string of years. But it turns out that just by looking at the data itself, we can't tell whether the future is going to look like the one on the bottom or the one on the top. And so the question is, you know, what's the difference between these two situations? And what Forrester was trying to say is we can use system dynamic models as like a microscope to look under the surface here and focus in on those details and say, if I have a system dynamics model that can produce this outcome and also can produce this outcome, then I can ask, what are the differences in the parameters of the two models that produce this outcome and this outcome? And by noticing those differences, then I can use my model to suggest that if my model is correct, then the reason this is happening here is because of this explanation in terms of my model variables versus what's going on here. So the model provides you a new way to look at data that otherwise just look like our, it's almost it's random, like that, you know, that this one happens to recover randomly and this one happens to be, say, collapsed randomly. And Forrester's saying that there may be a role for randomness, but without randomness, we can still produce these two trajectories consistently with a certain set of parameters, it'll look like this, and consistently with another set of parameters, it'll look like that. So that suggests to us that these parameters might actually be a better causal explanation for these two outcomes. And that's kind of what Forrester is trying to say in these sorts of things. Um, and so there's a question, uh, there's questions online about, uh, is this I equals DAT? And, uh, and I would say that, that, um, that this, uh, these dynamic models, the models that you may have heard of that are mentioned in the chat here are kind of these equilibrium models. And this is actually modeling not sort of equilibrium behavior, but actually how things happen over time. And so it, the, the, the theory that's being tested is the dynamical model itself. And this will become more clear as we start to build these models ourselves. So I guess I'll just say, hold on to that thought. And I think the, the, the difference between the equilibrium models you've heard about and the dynamical models we hear will become more clear as we move on in the class. 
Um, okay, so, so this simple model gives us is a generalizable strategic model that helps us test hypotheses about what might cause collapses in some scenarios and regeneration in others. That's kind of what we're hoping for here. Now, the caution that I want to give you here is that um, a lot of people don't like Forrester's limits to growth model, economists in particular. And that's major, and we talk about this in 325. So uh, when I teach 325, and I think other faculty do too, this is the textbook we use, uh, Markets and the Environment. And in this K&O textbook, um, they have a whole section devoted to limits to growth and talks about how one of the downsides to Forrester's model is the assumptions, garbage in, garbage out. And they talk about here, so the limits of assumptions, that's their way of saying garbage in, garbage out. And they talk about how the assumptions are far too restrictive. So this is just me quoting them. Uh, I'm not gonna read this throughout here. And they specifically say that Forrester leaves out responses to scarcity. So in Forrester's model, when natural resources become scarce, people just keep using them the same way they've been using them. But economists will know, and we talk about this in 325, economists know that as resources become more scarce, what typically happens to prices when a resource becomes more scarce? Anybody? They go up. I see why well, I see kind of pointing. I saw hand raising and by pointing and things like that. That's right, prices generally go up when resources become more scarce. And when prices go up, people use less of the resource. And so if we look at the history of natural resource trajectories over the last 150 years, you can see um, you know, coal give way to natural gas to give way to gasoline. And most of these shifts in natural resources were driven by the economics of scarcity. As a resource that was plentiful became lot, not so plentiful, its price skyrocketed, became, and there was an investment in, um, in using a new resource and so on. So the general idea that there are a finite number of resources on the planet is a good one, but maybe um, there were important dynamics that were left out of Forrester's model. And that's what the economists say. If you really want to try to get a better idea of what these shapes look like and what the time scale of these shapes are, we really need to model um, an economically realistic way people use scarce resources. But um, so that might be a cause for optimism. So, you know, peak oil, this sort of movement largely comes from thinking about the world in a forester sort of way. Um, but, you know, economists um, say, well, natural resource, like oil is a natural resource that's largely privately owned. And we generally know that privately owned non renewable natural resources tend to have price signals that end up favoring their, their um, conserving them in the long run. And so a lot of economists don't like the idea behind peak oil, because when you really think about the dynamics of the, the economics, um, it doesn't quite make a lot of sense. And so there might be some cause for optimism. Um, when you, so when you look at limits to growth, you might think, oh, this is really depressing. But the stuff that foresters left out might mean that, well, actually, this is probably a very conservative case, and it's maybe um, a lot worse than things are. So, um, but what Forrester could have done, and what the economists have now started to do, is to take models like this and explicitly model the economics in here. And so um, we'll actually do that in chapter eight. We'll see that in a kind of a, not in limits to growth exactly, but we will model the global oil market and we will build in um, these price signals and show how the price signals on non-renewable natural resources make the dynamics far more interesting and far less simple uh, so, you know, cut as this case or this case. So there is definitely a way to bring dynamics and economics together. So this criticism the economists have, it's really a Forrester's model, not the dynamical system approach um, in general. So these two things can live together, economics and system dynamic modeling. But initially, you will see a lot of criticism of limits to growth from the economists. And it'll sound like criticism of system dynamics modeling in general, but it's not. It's criticism of Forrester's sort of short-sighted limited model, um, the limits to limits to growth. Um, as a, and you definitely can, and economists are doing this, take um, those economic signals and build them into dynamic models 
and it makes them far more interesting and far more realistic. So that's an example of where um, maybe Forrester's model was a little too far in the metaphorical. A few more details would actually maybe move it in to the more useful area that we'd like to live. Okay. So questions about any of this stuff? Pretty clear so far. Okay. Okay, so um, so let's do an attendance exercise just to keep everybody awake. Um, I'll put the link in the chat just to make it convenient. And uh, the question that I'll leave for that I'll say here, um, how let's do, um, Is um, I just want to know: Are is economics, or are economics and system dynamics modeling um, in um, unable to be combined? So the question here is: um, Is there a fundamental mismatch between economics and system dynamics modeling that will make it so that econo economists will always hate system dynamics modeling and vice versa? So are they? Um, constantly at odds with each other. That's the question. So just yes or no would be fine with that. All right. And then don't submit it yet. We'll submit it at the end there. All right. So uh, stock and flow diagram. So um, this we're gonna. So this chapter kind of jumps right into the types of models we're hoping to build by the midterm. So we kind of are jumping ahead just to give us an idea of where we're going. So we're not kind of expecting you to understand all of this stuff. You're just trying to get an idea of where we could go with it. So like in the next lecture, we're gonna dial it way back and go into causal loop diagrams and do a lot of just general kind of systems thinking work as we build back up so that we'll eventually get back into reintroducing the stocks and flows. So we've got stocks and flow diagrams. Um, and so these diagrams underneath it all are calculus models that keep track of a, what we call a state variable or a stock. Um, in the middle here. So this is like an asset or a resource. That stock changes over time, but the things that make it change over the time are its so-called inflows and outflows. And so when we build system dynamics models, we set up formulas for the inflows and outflows that help de that are de determined by the level of the stock they're connected to, as well as other stocks in the model. So as other stocks are moving around, they're changing how these stocks are themselves moving around. And so it's an intercoupled, you know, a coupled web of interactions. And so um, if you're interested in seeing how these things work, um, I'll show a video of this, you know, just so I don't have to bring it up myself, but the book comes with a number of working models um, that run in this educational system of dynamics modeling tool called iThink, which is a version of Stella, which is the commercial tool that people use. And so I've got some links here that you can access afterwards. You can download those models and you can download iThink. iThink is a Windows program. Um, and so it once, time, once upon a time, they had a Mac OS version as well. Um, but I think now if you're Catalina or higher, you've got to use the Windows version with like parallels or so on. They may have, I haven't checked recently. They may have updated iThink so that it does uh, work on later versions of Mac OS, but somehow I doubt it. So you may just going to be stuck with parallels. So um, this is what, if you were to open up one of these models in I think you would see something like this. And, um, and so um, I'll go maybe to the next slide. I've got this video here where you can see me running this. And so there's multiple tabs on the side here of I think interface map model and equations. And you can go into this interface and it shows these diagrams that look just like the diagrams in your book. And so you can see that um, it will run for a certain period of time. And, um, and then it will, um, in this thing it's configured so that every period of time, it's changing the um, uh, certain parameters of the model that is producing different fish stock numbers. So if I were to go back here and look at the model itself, I can see that I've got a fish stock that I initialize the model in. I have new fish per year. So this is just a static regeneration there. Every year you get 200 new fish. And, um, and then it says every year you've got 300 coming out. 
And so if you've got 200 going in and 300 coming out, then this initial uh, quantity is gonna deplete over time because there's more going out than coming in. There's no feedback here. So it's just gonna constantly decline until you've got no fish left in your fishery. And so what they're doing in this model is they are holding, so I'll jump ahead here. All right, so they are, oh, mouse is gone. So they are um, holding, so if we look at the top here, so let me see if I can pause. There we go. So if hopefully you decipher this from your book, but they have these diagrams that are supposed to look good in black and white as well. And so up at the top, you see a legend where it says one fish stock, two new fish per year, three catch or harvest rate. So the fish stock, that's the box in the middle of that diagram I showed. The new fish per year, that's the flow coming into it. The catch or harvest rate, that's the flow going out of it. And so you can see those numbers on these lines here. So this blue line's got a one on it. There's a two on the red line down here. And there's a three that we can't really see. I think if I keep this running, the three will pop up on the green line here. So when this graph is complete, then even if it's printed in black and white, you can find those lines. I think there are some questions in the muddiest point about this y-axis over here. And so if I go, if I look at this, uh, my mouse wants me to be oriented this way. If I look at this y-axis, notice that it has two numbers, 400 and 4,000, and down here, 200 and 2,000. And if I look a little over here, it says one and then two, three, and the two and the three have a little bracket next to them. What that means is that the 4,000 is the units for line one, and the 400 is the units for lines two and three. If there wasn't that little bracket there, if it said one, two, and three separately, we would see three numbers over here, and the top one would go to the top line, the middle one would go to the middle line, the bottom one would go to the bottom line. So this is just a way for them to show multiple axes and multiple lines in a way that you could print in black and white. Now, as I run, what they're doing here is they are keeping the new fish per year constant. So this red line is gonna be, it's gonna be constant all the way across, but at different times in the sim, they're causing the harvest rate to ramp up or ramp or go down. So in this initial period, when they, the new fish per year and the harvest rate were identical, then the initial fish stock stays constant. In this period, as the harvest rate goes up, now they're harvesting more than it's being regenerated. And so the fish stock is declining in population. And so if I keep going with this, then we see that they're going to reach um, additional points here where they're gonna then bring that, that harvest rate back down. And once it equals again, then uh, we see the fish population levels out. So um, our indicators here of a sustainable outcome for this Maybe if I were to jump back just a hair. So if I were to, I think I paused that. No, I didn't. Good. All right. So we know that this ultimately, this is a sustainable outcome because the fish stock is not declining anymore. And, or you could view it the other way, the inflow is equal to the outflow. So sustainability in terms of these stock and flow models often means that there is a path towards the inflow rates balancing the outflow rates. And the system comes into balance with a non-zero level of the thing that we want to maintain. So if they maintained a catch rate of 200 um, that would happen to match the regeneration rate of 200, then they could continue to catch 200 fish per year forever. And that's a sustainable outcome. That's what it's sort of communicating here. So that's the way we kind of read this graph here. And so um, if I let this thing run out, get where we're going with this. Um, this is just showing that same view. So in Stella or in I think, you can also watch it instead of in the graph view, you can watch it in this interface view. And it's showing you this, this level in this fish stock declining. And, um, and then, so it starts high, it goes low, and then it stays constant. So we're just visualizing this now, um, actually right on the interface, but it's exactly the same thing we saw back here in the graph. 
So that's um, an example of the types of models that you can see. And so all of the models that are in chapter one and throughout the book, you can download and run within iSync if you want to further experiment with that. And you can even go into iSync and you can adjust parameters. So under this model and under this equation, you can actually adjust the parameters um, and play with these models and see what would happen if I change this to this and so on and so forth. This is kind of a trivial model. So once we have feedbacks, just like in the more complicated fisheries model in the rest of the chapter, then, um, then a lot more interesting things happen. So uh, let's move on here. So that brings us to um, the main model that they focus on throughout the fishery. And so this is a more realistic view of fish uh, population growth. And so the idea here, we have our stock of fish, we have births that come in every year at some rate, the number of fish divided by the carrying capacity of the fishery gives us a fish density and that fish density determines, or in other words, how close the fish density is to one, or how close the fish population is to its carrying capacity determines the regeneration rate. And so, and that regeneration rate then determines how the fish changes, stock changes over time. So there's a feedback here where the more fish you get, it changes the regeneration rate on the number of new fish you get in the future. And so if we analyze that, we can focus on this regeneration curve and we got this hump shaped curve here, which in the um, perusal, uh, some noted the relationship between it and some of the logistic growth models you might remember from SOS 101. If you were to plot some of your logistic growth models, like the one where you have DNDT is equal to um, N times one minus K over or N over K, um, that thing on the right hand side of that logistic growth model would look a lot like this plot here. But what's cool about the simulation is that we don't need to specify this plot with a mathematical formula. We can actually use data to say, we know the real regeneration rate. We know as we increase fish density in a fishery, this is what really happens. And that allows for deviations from these simplistic formulas. So it allows us to get a little more realistic. And so, but this general shape is that so long as there's positive growth, so as density goes up, regeneration go rate goes up, that generates what we're going to we're going to eventually call a reinforcing loop. So we're going to learn about positive feedbacks as we move into the lectures, the end of this week and next week. And this regeneration curve on the other side of it, so we hit a critical density, and above that density, as the density goes up, the regeneration rate goes down, and that um, that flip in those signs creates a negative feedback loop. So. There's positive feedback early in the fishery, negative feedback late in the fishery. And um, in the early positive feedback here, this is just modeling the general idea that each fish produces more fish. And so once you have more fish, you get, and this is sort of the exponential growth region. But eventually there's intraspecific competition. So eventually once you get so many fish, there's limited resources. And a one fish might have two offspring, but not uh, both of those offspring aren't gonna survive because they're fighting for food with all of the other offspring. And so as things get more and more dense, there's less and less food to go around, fewer and fewer offspring survive and the regeneration rate plummets. And so, um, so this is a big reason why you don't want to live near carrying capacity because each individual has a really hard time. So the optimal population size is probably such that you're like, you know, 60% of carrying capacity. So, you know, humans don't want to live with human carrying capacity. We'd all be living a very miserable life if we were all living at the carrying capacity of the planet. All right, so, um, and there's some other cool things that are in here that I'm not going to go into, but you notice there's this like cool little um, inflection point where it kind of rises and then it kind of goes up. This little difference in the, so this thing's not just a nice, uh, a nice hump. It's got this kind of acceleration and then the hump. And that's what we refer to as an Ali effect. And we talk about populations. I'm not going to, I don't want you to memorize Ali effect. I'm not going to test you over Ali effect. But these Ali effects um, create really interesting extinction dynamics in populations. So they make populations really delicate. And, um, and so this is just showing that you can add all sorts of really cool effects in simulation that would be much more difficult to model mathematically, which is one of the advantages of using the simulation approach where we can just draw whatever curve we want here rather than having to come up with a formula for it. 
All right, so with all of that, when we have a reinforcing loop and a balancing loop, as we will learn later in the class, you combine those things together, and you might remember this from system dynamics if you've taken that, and you get S-shaped growth. And so not surprisingly, coming out of the simulation, we've got um, line two is new fish per year, and line one is fish stock. So this line one rises and levels off. That's your S-shaped growth right there. And so, um, so that is a response to so these two things together, the reinforcing and the balancing together. So we're going to learn to recognize, look at all of these diagrams, recognize all the feedback loops. And then once we see patterns of loops, we can predict what might come out of the simulation. And if it doesn't come out of the simulation, then that ends up um, sort of helping us focus on what exactly is special about our simulation that's preventing the kind of prototypical take case. So knowing these kind of typical cases helps us sort of, uh, you know, set up flags for what to investigate in our sim. And so, so that's the general popular fish population model. Are there any questions about this general model and how it works? So again, stock and flows, I know this is super new. We're gonna go into how to build stock and flows later. We're just kind of jumping ahead to kind of show where things are going. So I'm not expecting you to know all of this stuff yet. This again is just more of where we're going, but general questions about this basic idea that we have a feedback loop where fish, their density affects their regeneration rate and that sets up this S-shaped growth curve. Does that make some sense? All right, so to add more realism, then we need to add um, predation to this. And so, um, so yeah, there's, and if you want, you can go into I think and you can simulate this and you'll get exactly the same curves. So, um, so that we've got our basic fish population model up here. And what they've done is they've just taken, I'm going to stand on this side for this. They've just taken the fish density that's down here and they then uh, buckle it up here to an effect of fish density on catch per ship. And they create a separate population model down here on ships that are out there catching fish. And so the fish density ends up affecting how many, um, how many fish the ships can catch. And the number of ships that are catching fish goes up and changes an outflow rate on the fish stock that wasn't there before. So this outflow rate on fish stock is now added and this effective density on ultimately that outflow rate is down here. So we've added another sort of feedback loop here that's gonna affect the dynamics. And so this is a really simple model of ships at sea. Um, and so um, this effect of fish density on catch per ship this simple model helps us focus our lens on something on, on this pattern, on, on exactly what happens with density increases on how many uh, fish are caught. And so there are two ways that we frequently will model up here for this effect. And one of them is called a type one response, which they talk about at the end of the chapter in the cunning fish model. The other one's called a type two response, a functional response, which looks a little bit more like this, which might be more realistic for the fish. And so the idea here with uh, this type two response is that when densities of the fish get really high, then a slight decrease in density has almost no effect on the, the predation rate and almost no effect on the catch rate of these ships. It isn't until you go way down beneath that that the, 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 the ships start actually seeing less fish per ship. That's kind of this nonlinear effect. That's what we get from this. That's a so-called type two functional response when it levels off this way. And so um, we can contrast that with this type one response, the cunning fish, where if even at the highest densities, if you have a slight decrease in density, you immediately get a decrease in catch per ship. Now the book talks about what if the fish were, they talk about that fish, um, the reason this happens, does anybody remember why does this happen? Why at low densities, at lower densities, why are fish still easy to catch? Yeah. Right, that's right. So we know that the, in the kind of the natural biology of these fish, that at low densities, they still attract or are, are found together. So even though there are maybe 
bigger gaps between clumps in the fishery, when you find fish, it's easy to find more fish. So this is from this clumping response. And so they said, well, what if the fish were cunning and they didn't clump together? And so they, you know, they stayed always apart from each other, kind of so they're truly random. Then um, as the density decreased, you immediately get an effect on you know, catch per ship. Now, we can't make the fish behave any differently. But what we might be able to do is add regulation so that boats, if we were able to sense accurately how many fish were in the fishery, we might be able to adjust quotas per boat so that we could actually enforce this functional response. So this is kind of a natural functional response. And this could be a functional response after we add regulation. So that's a way we can use these two scenarios to think about that. That pushes a problem to say, well, how the hell are we going to estimate the density accurately and fast enough? And how are we going to actually get people to um, comply with our quotas? But that's at least more manageable problems than we had before when we just allowed things to be a free for all. So that's kind of where they're kind of we're going with this. So um, this is almost like feeling like in this region, the regulatory feedback is broken. So we can add it in with, um, with regulation, like with you know, human regulation. So that's kind of like these two regions of the type two functional response, that when the fish are clumping together, you get no regulatory feedback until they eventually get so sparse that it kind of kicks in. And the type one response, then, um, then we sort of force uh, this regulatory feedback everywhere. And we can either do that with smarter fish or with regulation. So if we look at the kind of natural case, then what they showed here, um, and I don't want to get into this in too much detail, I want to make sure that we don't, uh, we cover everything here, but we're almost done, um, is that if we look at this simulation outcome, the thing that you want to pay attention to is the ships at sea, this line four, which is this red line down here. And at this line four, um, the, Interesting is you start out with no ships at sea, and the, uh, the, the fish stock, this line one, it races up towards its carrying capacity. And you get a lot of fish in the fishery, and then they unleash the boats. And so the sh ships at sea start climbing, and as they start climbing, the catch starts climbing. And the catch climbs, and we can look at the new fish per year, which is this line two. So long as line two, the red line is above line three, the green line, the fish keep growing. But at the instant where they touch and then line three, the catch becomes more than line two, the, um, the replenishment rate, then you notice at that instant, the fish stock stops growing and it comes down, it starts declining. Now, the fishermen can't see that. All they can perceive is the catch per ship. But underneath the water, the fish, this this balance, uh, it's kind of like a savings account. You're starting to buy, you're starting to spend your principal. So you're living off interest initially, and then now you're living off the principal, and you're and eventually you're going to deplete all the money in your bank. And so that's kind of what's happening here. Now, eventually, what's going to happen due to this type two functional response up here is that the fish density will get low enough that the catch per ship is going to start to decline. And that's what we see um, in this three. It eventually, it starts declining rapidly. And at that point where it starts declining, what we've modeled is that now imagine that the fishermen or fisher people um, start radioing back to the management and saying, we're not seeing that much fish. And so they then start pulling their boats out of the, the ocean or out of the fishery. And as they start pulling them out, they can't, they don't pull them out fast enough and the fish population just keeps declining until there's no more fish in the fishery. And what's interesting here is that the number of ships um, out here, they had the same number of ships as they end with. Out here, they were actually getting fish catch, but out here at those same number of ships, they're not anymore. So really over here was where the intervention should have happened. But the intervention happened when the density got so low that it started to become noticeable, but at that point it was too late. Really the only thing you could do at this point is to pull all of the boats out and let the fish population rebound, um, but that didn't happen. They pulled them out too slowly, so slowly that it collapsed. So that was kind of the lesson in that simple um, type one 
or sorry, type two functional response, we have no regulatory feedback in this region. We really needed something to kick in early, but it didn't happen. So what's cool about this is we can say, well, what if we had cunning fish? Now, again, how do we get cunning fish? That's another question that kind of pushes the question, but that's a more manageable question for policymakers. And so now we know that at even small declines in density, you'll actually get that regulation in the catch per ship. If we implement that, the exact same model, just with that different functional response implemented, then we actually get a sustainable outcome. So here, um, they even left the, the, the number of ships following the exact same pattern was in before. And what we end up seeing here is that the catch line three per ship immediately starts tapering off. And so the, the, the difference between line three and line two, the catch, the outflow, and the number of new fish per year, the inflow, is always pretty close. And so this fish stock doesn't decline quite so much. And yet, as it's declining, it, even though it's not declining that much, the catch per ship is declining because of this cunning fish model. And so it does eventually allow lines two and line three to equilibrate. And so here, the inflow is equal to the outflow. And that means that the fish stock is allowed to find a balance point where it can stick forever. So the fish stock is stabilized and it can stay there forever. And uh, the equivalent statement is that the catch is equal to the new fish per year. So these are quantifiable measures of a sustainable outcome. So simply by making you know, either smarter fish or a regulatory policy, which implements quotas that do that, then without doing anything else, the system naturally takes care of itself and we get a sustainable outcome. That's kind of the lesson there. So um, the model, the underlying model didn't change, but the functional response, that cunning uh, fish, that's what ended up changing there. And that's what allowed us to sort of say, okay, we do have a path to sustainability. And that path suggests we just need to find a regulatory policy that can do that to the functional response to the catch per ship. So that's kind of what we're just saying there. So. Um, this is just summarizing that idea here, cunning fish, that linear response restores sustainability to the system. How do we get cunning fish? Like I said, if you can't get smarter fish, you can say, can we implement the effect of smarting smarter fish by creating quotas on those ships that smartly reduce the quota as the density decreases? The problem with that is how the hell do you measure density in a fishery? That's another issue, but that's at least an issue that we can start to tackle with technology um, as opposed to before where we didn't really even know what was going on. So any questions about that kind of story? Yeah. Um, in the first uh, example, when it, like population crashed, mm -hmm. the catch is higher than the fish stock like for a while. Like, mm. Right, so some of that I think is in the, um, is in, so if I go back to that, thanks for that question. So the question for those online was, um, it's confusing when this, this stock, when this crashes because there seem to be periods of time where the catch is larger than the fish stock. And some of that comes with how to read these, this axis over here. And so um, when we look at the catch three, that is corresponding to this middle number. And so if I look at, let's say, um, so, so like, okay, so here's an example. So this, at this point, the green line looks like it's above the blue line, but the blue line is actually going way up to near 4,000. So the, this blue, even though this blue line looks like it's under the green line, it's just being plotted at a different scale. So they're only pulling out, the green line corresponds to the middle number. So they're pulling out like, uh, let's say 900 fish per year. Um, and yet there are at this point, um, you know, 2000 or so, because this line's 2000. So they're pulling out 900 per year, but there's 2000 left in the fish, in the fishery. Does that make sense? Yeah, sorry to notice that before. Yeah, it's real subtle, but yeah, so that's these legends here. Any other questions? Any questions online? All right, so, so yeah, that's basically chapter one. This is an example of the types of things that we hope to do with the models that you build, that you'll end up building for your final projects, the same sorts of investigations. Scenario planning 
what if things were like this, what would the outcome be? That's why these are models. They're answering what if questions. What if we had cunning fish? Wow, cunning fish would be really great. How do we get cunning fish? Well, that is a manageable question for us to talk about. So um, other things, so moving forward here, um, we're gonna start working with positive diagrams and VinSim. Um, so, um, so just kind of look ahead to that. Um, it's not a, a bad idea to try to have VinSim installed on your machine, but all VinSim is installed on all the machines that are in this room. So if you come to class, you've got VinSim available. If you're attending from home, definitely recommend you grab VinSim. Eventually we'll use Insight Maker. Insight Maker is not that great at drawing causal loop diagrams, but it's really good at drawing the uh, stock and flow. So really would like people to have uh, VinSim installed. Um, otherwise, assignments moving forward. Again, there'll be a muddiest point this weekend. Start reading chapter three. It's due uh, for lecture B3. And, um, and that's kind of all I've got for you. So with that, um, let's have our closing attendance exercise and then we'll see you all Thursday. So that attendance exercise, and then you can, is um, what type of functional response does cunning fish um, uh, uh, correspond to? Um, and that's my question is type one or type two? And I'm not grading for correctness, just grading for coherence. You can give me a one or a two uh, or a type one or a type two. There was a question online, start reading chapter three or chapter two. Um, I think I said, I think I said chapter two. Yeah, so chapter two is the next chapter we'll be reading. And that's all I've got for you. So we'll see you Thursday. Any other questions from online? If not, I'll be closing the meeting out soon. Um, type one is the linear one. Yep. Because they're presented them in different, yeah. Yeah, the ecologists present the linear one as kind of more simplistic. And then so type one is like in the simple case, it's imagine it's linear, but in reality, it's usually not linear. So that's why we go one to two. And then just as a sort of a bonus, type three is S-shaped. So it adds even more complexity. Well, it, it actually represents learning. So as the, the predator uh, at low densities doesn't really know how to how to get the prey, but at high densities it learns and it's much more efficient. So you get this like this acceleration um, at kind of intermediate densities before like, yeah, so, but, but we won't go into that, but that's just sort of, you know, the, the, these are kind of the classical functional responses from ecology. And I saw you had a question next and then I figured, so hold on, um, let me just end uh, here.